<laughs> I just don't know. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder which is rougher, teaching these students of mine all semester long or composing a final exam for them. You know, when you consider all the progress that America has made from 1900 through 1950, then start trying to write an exam that can cover all that. You've got, really got a job. That isn't easy. So I guess uh, my best bet is to consult an old authority. Some old newspapers. <coughs> the journalism, you know, was coming into his own uh, at the turn of the century, really becoming an industrial giant. And in the early 1900s, papers were pretty faithfully echoing the country's cries for reform through muckraking and exposing bad goings on in big business and so on. Now, let's see if we can't find some headlines to demonstrate these things. You see, foreign correspondents kept America pretty well informed of the progress of the First World War, although we'd been reluctant to get into it. Once we were in, we wanted to know what was going on. And then when it was over, the newspapers really played it up. Look at the liberal use of pictures and uh, eye-catching appeal layout. Newspapers also played their part in getting world opinion to America, and they closely followed the progress of the League of Nations, destined to rejection by America and ultimate failure. Be here. The ultimate outcome will be the triumphant acceptance of treaty and league. I do not doubt the issue, said Mr. Wilson, September 7th, 1919. But it failed. This fail failure reflected itself in what was happening in America during the 20s, our slap-happy, hectic, frenetic jazz age. That was the time when all we were interested in was the search for pleasure and new sensations. And our newspapers changed to fit the times. Then in came the tabloid, the small-sized paper that blared out headlines about crime and uh, the private lives of personal people. Now, the 20s were the time of prohibition, too, and of rum running in waters just outside the legal limit. Now, this is the tabloid-sized paper. And the 20s ended with the Great Crash of 1929, the worst depression America has ever known. And when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president in 1932 and started all of his alphabetical agencies, he hoped to put the country back on its feet. You would think that, uh, but after his first few months in office, the press didn't follow him. I guess they sort of resented some of the restrictions on the, in the newspaper code there in the NRA agency. But uh, something, uh, something else filled their pages. In 1941, after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, we were at war once again. Here, this one tells the story. War is declared by Congress. Heavy loss in Hawaii attack. December 8, 1941. Well, I've got all kinds of headlines here about the coverage of the war. But here's the one we were all looking for. This one. Victory. Surrender is signed. Monday, May 7, 1945. Well, I've got some headlines here about the formation of the United Nations and the strikes and inflation and the shortages and communist scares that swept America after the war, as well as our entry into the Korean War. But that isn't getting my test written. Besides, I might as well admit it. I hate to face it, these old bones just take, don't take these hard chairs too well anymore. <clears throat> I guess us weary old professors should have better upholstered furniture. Ah. Well, now, that test. <clears throat> Hmm. I guess uh, <coughs> architecture be as good a place to start as any. Now this pile here, pictures I've selected from my files, <coughs> dealing entirely with architecture. But you remember the passion we had in the early 1900s for progress and industry? And Louis Sullivan, wa Sullivan was meeting this passion with his skyscrapers. He emphasized the fact that the form of the building should follow its use. Here is his Carson Peary Scott store in Chicago. <coughs> and soon other architects were following Sullivan's lead, and city skylines were broken by tall, narrow buildings jutting high into the air to take up as little ground space as possible. 
Frank Lloyd Wright, a student of Sullivan's, was making an impact with his theory of blending the building into its environment. He also harmonized style, materials, and furnishings. Well, the stock market crash after the booming prosperity of the 20s hit architecture with a bang. It came virtually to a standstill during the 30s. The people didn't want new homes. They wanted money to pay their rent. They didn't want a new office necessarily. All they wanted was a job in any old office. Well, with the Depression years, however, our slum areas increased. And more and more families were evicted because they couldn't pay their rent. And then, for the first time in history, the federal government undertook a program of slum clearance and low-cost housing to give everybody a chance at a decent living condition. And World War II brought us prefabricated houses, homes with parts prepared separately and assembled quickly as an acute housing shortage sprang up around factories and army bases. Then after the war, significant new, new shapes and designs were seen in the new buildings springing up all over the country, and many of which were influenced by the work of such architects from war-torn Europe as Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe. Well, I think these pictures are going to do just fine on that display board I'm fixing up for my class. Get them a little better organized here. Showing the more significant developments, of course. Oh, say, I just thought, uh, I have some material on the theater. I left it upstairs. Let's see if we can get Esther to bring it down for us. Oh, Esther. Yeah, yeah? I left some scripts and material on the theater up there lying on the coffee table in the living room. Would you bring them down, please? No. Thank you. You know, we were talking not too long ago about the uh, theater just after the turn of the century. The plays didn't reflect the desire for change that was so prevalent in society then. They were just a means of entertainment and escape. But a little later on, about 1910, the plays started pointing out the problems of the day. Then along came William Vaughn Moody, who brought the poet into the theater and the... Is this what you wanted, dear? That's the envelope. And, you know, I managed to find some thumbtacks for that display you're working on. Oh, good. Thank you. I was afraid I was going to have to put them on the chewing gum. Oh, I'd like to see you chew that one. What's in the envelope? Oh, some material on the theater. Oh. I'll just recall what all I do have here. <laughs> There's an old relic. One of the first World War plays came out in the 20s. Oh, yes. What price glory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, say, I thought you put this in the trunk with uh, the rest of those old things from the 1920s. Please to look at the formidable object on the floor behind you. Oh, oh the bad penny has returned. <laughs> <laughs> Not with a lot, uh, without a lot of pulling and dragging on my part, I can assure you. Well, as long as you were dragging to get these plays of the 1920s, uh, I should think you'd have something of Eugene O'Neill. Well, just between you and me and the trunk lid, I have. Oh. Can't forget how Eugene O'Neill was commenting on those bewildered Americans of that era and their, their need for a newer meaning in life. Well, now, speaking of commenting on the American life, then uh, I hope you got something of Maxwell Anderson. Maxwell Anderson? Mm -hmm. Afraid I forgot him. Oh. Forgot he was writing about the Sacco Vanzetti case then. Well... <coughs> Why did you call me down here, then? I just thought maybe you'd help me help me arrange some of this stuff on the theater. You, you've got a background there that ought to help. Hmm. I see where my theater training comes in handy again. Well, now, uh, what do you have hard for these later years? Well, uh, give me a suggestion. Well, uh, let's see. Now, for the 1930s, you must have material on the Federal Theater and how it helped the acting profession. Hmm, got a picture of one of the plays right here. Oh, good. Oh, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of social uh, plays on social protest in that time, too. And uh, now for the 1940s, Howard, uh, don't forget all those uh, wonderful war plays and the musicals that came out then. Oh, you bet not. For those, we've got Winged Victory, and This is the Army, and Oklahoma. Oh, yes, we were talking about those just the other day. They're the ones with the wonderful songs and the dances and... Uh, 
Let me take you out in the Surrey. With a friend, John Top. <laughs> well, just drive your Surrey right over here by the desk and we'll look oh, for some more music. Well, I was just beginning to enjoy that ride. <clears throat> well, you've been right in style in the 1900s. Oh, well, not for long, though. Remember the uh, horseless carriages? Yes. And don't forget that uh, we're looking for some tunes for these eras, right. too. Mm -hmm. Now, here. Look at these photos that I've selected here to put on the display board. Hmm. Well, for goodness, that doesn't look like anything, only just an old airplane. <gasps> My goodness. That's the Wright Brothers' first flight. Oh. Mm-hmm. And the tune I selected to go with it. Uh, Come, Josephine, in my flying machine. Oh, now, really, Howard, <laughs> don't stretch the point too far. Well, maybe this one will be a little closer. Let's see. Here. Oh, um... Uh, my Mary Oldsmobile? Well, that would get a passing grade, but here's what I really had in mind. Oh, get out and get under. He had to get out and get under to fix his automobile. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Say, are, are those all the songs, though, you're going to have on that display board? Oh, no, but I, I'm, I'm a little short on original pictures and material up until the music of the First World War. Oh, well, what else was there? Well, besides the musical shows like uh, Merry Widow, We Can't Forget 1912, and Irving Berlin wrote Alexander's Ragtime Band. Oh, no, Ragtime, and, and the blues came out about then, too. Mm -hmm. And here's a, here's a stack of that music from the First oh. World War. Mm -hmm. I throw something, real old timers. I think they ought to make a good picture on the display. Well, do you, uh, do you expect to get all these on that display board? Oh, yes. We've got more coming, too. We haven't covered the uh, Roaring 1920s, the Jazz Age, you know. Well, what are you going to use for that? Ah, uh, I'll show you. <laughs> no, Howard, no. How about that, huh? <laughs> I'm representing a, a collegiate and uh, and uh, all those songs of the Roaring Nineteen Twenties, the Charleston, all those, sure. <laughs> oh, I, I surely want to be around when you try to hang that on that little display board. Well, if there isn't room for me, I'll hang a picture of Rudy Valley instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take it off. You surely must be too warm. Yeah, well, it is pretty warm. <laughs> Give it back to the raccoons for all of me. But now. We must pick out some more music and pictures here. Right. Now, let's see. For the 1930s, during the Depression, we could use uh, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we would want uh, Happy Days Are Here Again for the mm -hmm. FDR era. And then you want some swing tunes and uh, war songs mm -hmm. and uh, tunes from the popular Broadway musical. Yes. Mm -hmm. All of which brings us around very neatly to where we started. Mm -hmm. In the story with the fringe on top. Right. <laughs> But now, listen, now, don't you dare forget the classical music. Oh, no, no. We have some very nice material on Menotti's operas, mm -hmm. and the music of Copeland and Gershwin, and the uh, symphony orchestras, too. Oh, that's mm -hmm. good. But you know what? What? Sit down here. I, I, I have an idea I want to tell you about. All uh, right. You know, I think that you should only put the important things on that display board. You're not going to have enough room. Oh, you mean just kind of hit the highlights of each particular mm -hmm. art field? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, now, you take the dance, for instance. Now, that's closely related to music. And if you put all about the things on that board, you're not going to have room and you're going to have a lot of repetition. Well, now, maybe you've got a point mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mention it, uh, just for fun, let's take a look at the dance field okay, there. Okay, fine. The, um, just the highlights, of course. Oh, uh, just the salient points. Just the salient points. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> that gives me an idea. Now, we could use a little contrast here. Now, say, for instance, we take just the important developments and changes in ballroom dancing. Mm -hmm. Well, now, the, the waltz should come first, then. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. We go back to the 1900s and pick up Waltz Me Around Again Willie for mm -hmm. a starting point. And then ragtime? Yes, and, and then all the uh, uh, crazy dances, you know, the grizzly bear, mm -hmm. turkey trot, bunny <laughs> hug, and all those. And then comes the, the Charleston of the jazz age. Mm -hmm. And then swing and the jitterbugs. Mm -hmm. Say, let's look at a few of the pictures oh, that go fine, along with it. Here, look at those old waltzers.
Funny how many memories can one picture can bring back, isn't it? <laughs> My goodness, yes, it certainly is. And you know, it, it just seemed as though a person could almost see those dances. Ah, you have a vivid imagination, my dear. Oh, thank you, my dear. Now, uh, what about dances other than ballroom? Other than ballroom? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <clears throat> to make a long but concise speech, mm -hmm. only college professors can do that, you know. Oh, sure. <clears throat> I think I would organize them about in this order. Let's take first uh, Isidore Duncan. Uh, she broke all the dance traditions by dancing according to her inner personal experiences. And number two might be Martha Graham, who, in the late 1920s, with others, began to make dancing a creative art rather than just imitative. And number three would be a few members of the ballet theater, which started in the early 1940s. And here we have a picture of a scene from one of the Broadway stage musicals, Carousel. Oh, well, now, say, that was very masterfully done, Howard. Now, are you going to be uh, able to do as well on literature? Well, with those words of praise to spur me on, how could I do less? Oh, it's possible. It is possible. <laughs> <coughs> well, <coughs> instead of asking them to trace the history of literature, as they usually do, I think I'll ask for specific examples of literature changing the life of the country in some way. Oh, dear, that's really going to be a hard one. Oh, I don't know. Now, among other examples, we might take The Jungle by Upton Sinclair around the turn of the century. Oh, well, yes, I know about that. Now, that uh, exposed the uh, bad conditions in the meatpacking mm -hmm. industry, and eventually it led to government investigation, didn't it? Very good. Mm -hmm. You do quite well, with a broad hint, of course. Oh, well, now, listen, I know another one, and uh, without benefit of hints, broad or otherwise. Well, pray enlighten me. Uh, John Steinbeck's Rapes of Wrath. Very good, very good. And <coughs> that was so much read and discussed when it came out in 1939. And that got government help, too, uh, to the people living in the great dust bowls of the Middle West. Oh, well, yes, uh, uh, almost all of the writings of the 30s were social protests like Steinbeck's, weren't they? Well, that's true. It had been true of our literature pretty much from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'd always had our romanticists, both in literature and the theater. It seems like there was always somebody around who was commenting strongly on the times. <laughs> You know, uh, poetry, too, it seemed to me. Yes. Now, take a question on that. After the rebirth of poetry in about uh, 1912, uh, what were the poets like Frost and Sandberg writing about? Oh, I know. Uh, the strength and dignity of the common man. Very good. And they used the American scene for their content and developed an entirely new style. You know, Howard, I, I like this theme of yours. Literature reflecting the time it makes me feel quite bright. You know, I, I've had examples for most of it. Mm -hmm. Something tells me we've got a bright little gem about to emerge. Gee, well, I don't know about that, but now, right or wrong, uh, was the writing of the uh, 20s reflecting the uh, disillusion of the times, or was it not? I think you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Now, your question. What were the three representative writers of the 1920s? Um, Ernest Hemingway. Very good. Uh, Sinclair Lewis. Correct. Uh, well, say, who's taking this test anyhow, your wife or your students? <laughs> oh, well, let's see now. F. Scott Fitzgerald for that third one. Very good. And those three gentlemen were really reflecting and commenting on the lost generation. Mm -hmm. And we've already discussed the situation of the 30s. That was when the phrase candid camera approach mm -hmm. came into use because they were writing so realistically on the Depression. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the 40s, though, Howard? It seems to me there were a lot of uh, religious books came out then. Right again. And uh, there again, the writers were answering the need of the people. This time for a need for a faith in a period of war. Mm, you're so right. And, and the war books that came out then, well, they were a natural result, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thought I heard the doorbell. I didn't hear a thing. Well, I'm sure I did. Well, there's someone up there better go up and see who it is. Probably the mailman. <laughs> you wouldn't hear it because you're just uh, listening to the groanings of oh. <laughs> your pupils over that test. But Thank I'm you. sure I heard it, and I'll just go see. You'll have two hours to write it. Well, there it is. <laughs> well, that display panel should prove to be quite interesting to the class. It will probably remind them of uh, lots of points they can use in the test. I formulated some Lulus for questions. They'll all be answered essay style, of course, and... Uh, here, I want to read you a couple of them. See how you can do all of them. Keep them over here in my drawer. There will be no cribbing in my class. <coughs> Let's see now. <coughs> Trace the history of radio broadcasting and show its social influence. Ah, they can write for a long time on that one. 
Well, just so they hit a few of the salient points, like Esther says. Now, this pile of pictures here, it's all on radio. And right near the top here, I want to show you a pic here, a picture of a new microphone. Quite a change in design from the, the mics that uh, were used in the early days of broadcasting. Of course, others had been used during World War I, but in the 20s, radio began to grow to what it is now. And those mics were used to give us music and the voices of some interesting personalities. And then, in, in the 1930s, with the election of Franklin Roosevelt, the people of America listened to the new president give them words of hope and security. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Yes, those microphones have been important things to Americans since the start of radio. And who can deny the social force of broadcasting? The whole broadcasting field, when we think of the news reporting and all the music and the culture and the entertainment, the radio is brought to people remote from the heart of the large cities. Well, as I say, the students should uh, have enough to talk about the question on radio. I suppose then we look at another question about uh, uh, another medium that has influenced the lives of Americans since its start. And uh, I'm referring to the motion picture industry. Now, my question on that is, give some specific examples showing how the movies as an art have reflected our life and times. That's another broad question. Luckily, the test lasts for two hours. <laughs> Don't run away, I'm not gonna talk that long. Give you just a few general statements. The moving picture industry, more than any other art medium, has always commented on the social and political structure of our society. And through the wars and during the depressions and in the time of labor unrest, there have been screenplays about the times. And in many instances, they have taken sides on the issues. Well, let's see, what does that leave us with? Oh, yes, art and sculpture. Well, I don't have this stuff very well organized. In fact, about all I've done is spread out a few prints. I have them over here on the couch. But I think they will give us an idea of what we're talking about. Let's just look at a few of them. <clears throat> now, there were several different periods in American art from 1900 to 1950. The first came in 1908 when a group of painters that called themselves the Eight began painting so realistically. Now this one is a good example. It's The Spielers by Lukes. Shows two little slum girls happy even in their sordid surroundings. And next we have the introduction of European modern art to America by way of the 1913 Armory Show. Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase really astounded people. Now this kind of art influenced our painters. And after the first war, we saw all kinds of new styles. And in the 1920s, however, we swung to painting the American scene. And Charles Birchfield, this is his old town, Hammondsville, Ohio, is known as the father of the American scene movement. And this was carried even farther in the 30s when regionalism came into being. Grant Wood was one of the many painting about certain regions of America as in his American Gothic. The 30s also saw works protesting social conditions, as in this one, William Gropper's powerful satire, The Senate. And during the 30s, the government stepped in with its WPA art project to sponsor unemployed artists. This Tenement by George Biddle was produced during his WPA days. And then in the 40s, we saw a wave of abstract art, with almost every possible style being explored. Now, Louis Guillaume's Odyssey for Moderns is a very good example of that type of work. Well, now, when I finish the questions on art, I'll just have one more phase to cover, sculpture. And there's so much to be said on that. Find the pictures of sculpting all piled up here on the desk. We take a quick review. Uh, well, bear with me while we organize them just a little bit. And I think we can find some that will Show us what sculpting was doing. Let's see now. I want to be sure and include something of the work of Sangadan and uh, Laredo Taft. 
who were considered two of the leading sculptors of the early part of the century. But let's see what we have here right at hand. Uh, I want one that shows the sculptors commenting on the times. Here, this one. A war memorial by Paul Manship in honor of the men who fought during the First World War. Oh, then here's a complete extreme. But it gives us an idea about the desire to use new materials and forms in the 1940s. It's one of Alexander Calder's mobiles called Black Spread. Well, I think they're just going to do fine and get them a little organized. Oh, here comes the wife to rescue me. Well, I see it was the postman then ringing the doorbell. And I took the liberty of opening the box. I see. Well, it, it would just save me going upstairs again with the wrapping paper. Yes, of course. <laughs> I hope I didn't interrupt your trend of thought. What were you doing? Oh, just getting some notes together on sculpture. Now, I wasn't really getting along too well, so I was glad you came down. Well, what do you think we have in the box? Oh, well, I took the liberty of sneaking a little peek, too. Oh, you did. <laughs> All is forgiven. I'll take the liberty of setting it over here on the desk, and we'll explore its contents. First, the packing. <laughs> now. Ha! Oh, no good heavens, what's that? That is an abstract form showing the use of building materials in the art field. Very mm -hmm. clever, don't you think? Never saw anything like that before. Well, I think we have some more interesting things in here. Oh, well, that. drag them out. I'm anxious to see them. Well, now there, model of a jet airplane. Hmm, well, well, now that I recognize. Isn't that something, though? <laughs> well, uh, what else is in here that is besides Excelsior? Well, they really packed them up tight, didn't they? Well, uh, here. Another abstract form. Huh. Hmm. Well, my dear, it looks as though the old professor is off on another era. Another era. And I think it's going to be fun. Good, I hope so. 